Good evening. I'm Adam Rosenthal from Falcon Chambers, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the second of this year's Blundell events. Although the current circumstances prevent us from hosting a live lecture and deprive us of the opportunity to fraternize with a drink and some nibbles beforehand, this online format has the advantage of enabling us to welcome viewers from up and down the country and indeed beyond. And I'm very pleased to tell you that we've had over 500 people registering for tonight's event. I'm joined on screen tonight by Anthony Tanney, whose excellent lecture on the doctrine of frustration and its application to leases you have hopefully now all seen. I, for one, found it immensely helpful in navigating the rather confusing jurisprudence on this subject. And we're all very grateful to you, Anthony, for your research and the talk you recorded for us. I'm also joined by Francis Richardson, a partner in Adelshaw Goddard's real estate disputes team, and Camilla Lamont of Landmark Chambers, both of whom bring a wealth of experience to bear. For those of you who weren't able to join the first of these virtual blundles a fortnight ago, this is your opportunity to let us have your views and to ask us any questions you have arising out of Anthony's lecture. We can't hear you or indeed see you, but the counter at the bottom of my screen tells me that there are lots of you out there, so please don't be shy. To ask us a question or to make a comment, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens and type your question in the box which appears. And it would also be good if you could identify yourself and your firm or your position. Between us, we will try to discuss as many of your questions as we can although we can't promise to get through all of them. Now, before we get going with the questions, I should also add that Anthony's written paper, which contains even more analysis and comment than the Action Pact recorded lecture, will be distributed later this month by email to all of those who have signed up to allow everyone an opportunity to watch the lecture first. Now, I can see on the question panel that we've already got some questions coming in. Um, and I'm going to start with this one, which goes right to the heart of the topic of frustrating leases. Um, and the question is this, in light of the Panalpina case, is there any scope to argue that the doctrine of frustration doesn't apply to leases? Now, Anthony, I, I think four out of the five law lords in Panalpina held that the doctrine can apply to leases. But doesn't that put aid to any argument to the contrary? Well, I, I, I think it would require Panalpina to be reversed by the Supreme Court. I think while Panalpina stands, um, I don't think there is any scope to argue that the doctrine doesn't apply to leases. It, you know, that is now the law. Um, in practical terms, it seems rather unlikely to me that um, the Supreme Court would ever either get the chance to overrule it or would take the chance if that chance was offered. Um, I mean, I, 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 for my own part, I, I think the reasoning in the Panalpina case is rather suspect, as perhaps you might have gathered from listening to the lecture. Um, it seems to me the House of Lords, on their way to the conclusion that they came to, pursued a couple of rather duff analogies. Um, one concerned equitable leases. I mean, it was established already before the Panalpina case that the doctrine of frustration could apply to equitable leases. And the House of Lords said, well, if it can apply to equitable leases, why can't it also apply to legal leases? Um, and it strikes me that the obvious answer to that question is that an equitable lease depends for its existence uh, on the existence of a specifically performable contract. So if the contract is discharged, a contract for the grant of the lease, so if the contract is discharged by frustration, the equitable lease falls away. And that's not the position with a legal lease. A legal lease creates a term of years, which as I explain in the lecture, has a, a life of its own independent of the lease that created it. And it does not, unlike an equitable lease, depend upon the subsistence 
of a valid contract. So it struck me that that was a duff analogy. Um, th there are other duff analogies as well. Um, one analogy was drawn with some shipping cases. It's established law again that certain types of shipping charter, so-called charters by demise, are susceptible to frustration. And the law lords rather, to my mind, simplistically thought, well, if a charter by demise uh, of a ship can be frustrated, then why not a demise of land? Um, overlooking the fact that the two types of contract use the same word, but have very different effects. Again, the difference being that a demise of land creates a term of years, which has its own independent life, whereas the rights of a hirer under a shipping charter um, are limited to the contract alone. That, that, that there are no rights independent, you know, with an existence independent of the shipping charter. So there are there are at least two duff analogies in there. There are other problems, I think, with the reasoning as well. But um, I I'd like to see the Supreme Court have another look at it. But whether it will or not is a is a different matter. Anyway, that, those were those were my thoughts on that. Um, on the question. Camilla, do you have any views on that? Um, yes, I mean, I, I broadly agree with Anthony in the sense that um, it's difficult to sort of uh, imagine the circumstances in which a, an appeal would come before the Supreme Court, because given the kind of hardly ever approach adopted in um, panel PINA by the House of Lords, uh, the reality is in most cases will fall on their facts. Um, and appeals won't be justified, so the court won't get the opportunity to, to consider the point. I mean, I think possibly um, the point may arise in a, a different context. It may arise in a successor case where the point may be determinative, um, but it also might arise in a completely different context um, where the Supreme Court is required to consider issues relating to the conceptual, uh, contractualization of leases more broadly, um, for example, if the Supreme Court was ever asked to determine whether a lease can be ended by repudiatory breach on the part of a tenant, an interesting question in itself, that might give the Supreme Court the um, opportunity or um, need to look, relook at panel PINA. Um, I mean, as to whether panel PINA was right on this point, I mean, I again agree with Anthony. I think there are some problems with the reasoning. Um, I think the, the, the answer to this point, in my view, depends on what the underlying theoretical basis for the doctrine of frustration actually is. Um, because if you, like I do, see it as actually um, justifiable as a sort of implication of a term case in exceptional circumstances, um, then there's no conceptual difficulty in, in that being applied to leases. Um, but if the principle um, is based on a broader uh, um, idea about frustration of um, a common purpose, as I think the modern authorities definitely suggest is the case, um, then its application to leases, I think, is far more problematic and questionable. I mean, Anthony's already raised the sort of key point, which is how does a doctrine that is supposed to operate prospectively um, operate to divest property interests? Um, and, and particularly, you know, what is the common purpose of a lease? Um, and if the lease is assigned, whose common purpose is, is relevant. So I think that um, the fact that there are so many practical problems with applying the doctrine to leases probably suggests there's something fundamentally more problematic with it in the first place. Camilla, you, you mentioned um, the question of the application of frustration where a, a lease has been um, assigned or the reversion has been assigned and we're dealing with successors rather than original parties. Um, one of the questions we, we, we've had in um, relates to the comments that Anthony made in his lecture on that. Um, and um, it's it said that Anthony referred to the, um, some difficulties in running a frustration argument where um, we're not dealing with the original parties and therefore there's no privity of contract and their relationship is governed by privity of state, a state or, or, or by statute post-1995. Um, and the questioner has asked if Anthony could elaborate on that. Well, it's it's simply that the um, the doctrine is a is part of the law of contract, and 
query can it has it ever been applied in a case where the legal nexus between the two parties is not contractual as it is in the case of a landlord and tenant by assignment um, but I mean you, you can you can take the view that if the House of Lords in Panalpina is prepared to break through the idea that a lease creates a term of years, which it was, and, and not to regard that as um, precluding the application of the doctrine to leases, then a court might also be prepared to break through the fact that in the case of a landlord and tenant by assignment, the relationship between them arises purely as a matter of law of real property. Um, in fact, th th there's, there's probably something in that, that view. Um, but if you regard the boundary between the law of property and the law of contract as something that needs to be maintained in order to um, ensure that the law continues to be underscored by some kind of principle, and doesn't just become a morass of individual decisions, then you would then possibly take the other view. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, it, 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 the point about assignees potentially raises some quite profound questions about the boundary between contract and property. Um, but then arguably so too did the panel pena case itself and that didn't stop the law lords deciding what they decided. Yes, we, we've had a few questions um, already about another point that was um, sort of left hanging by the Panalpina case, um, which is the question of whether one looks at the entirety of the term that was granted um, or the unexpired residue at the time of the frustrating event. Um, and that's been expressed in a number of different ways by different questioners um, with different scenarios. Um, Tony Radevsky refers to a hairdresser um, and Stephanie White gives a scenario which raises the same um, issue in relation to service offices. But I mean, that, that is also a, a point that, that um, is out there to be decided, isn't it? I, I think it is. I mean, I, in, in Panalpina, Lord Simon took the view that you should look at the whole term of the term of the lease rather than just the unexpired residue. Um, I mean, th this, this, this point arises because of the requirement that for a supervening event to bring about a frustration, it has to radically affect the bargain. Well, if the bargain is a bargain for a potentially rather lengthy duration, like, you know, leases tend to be, then that involves a a temporal comparison between the duration of the supervening event and the duration of, well, is it the, the whole lease or is it just the unexpired residue? Um, and when you're making, when you're asking that question, has the bargain been radically affected by the supervening event? What, it, what is it you're looking at, the whole bargain or just what's left of it? Um, I mean, my own view is that you look at the whole, the whole bargain, the whole lease term. I mean, if you, as I was thinking about this, um, I went out for a walk earlier today because I, I wondered whether this question might come up. And um, I was thinking about um, when I commute into London and there's, there's a, a couple of stationed car parks and they're empty, largely empty now. Um, and it did, I did think, well, what, what, about, what about a case where somebody takes a, a lease of a, suppose you've got a, a railway station that's served by a couple of car parks, okay? And somebody takes a lease of one of the car parks and during, during the term of the lease, or the other car park gets sold to a developer, so it ceases to be in use. So the lessee of car park number one has got a monopoly. He gets all the trade. He, he can put his prices up. It's a bonanza. He makes tons and tons and tons and tons of money from this piece of good luck. The other car park's been shut down. He has this piece of good luck. He makes loads of money. And instead of putting it aside against a rainy day, he blows it all on a yacht and a house in the south of France and a flash Harry car and so on. He has a great time. And then the pandemic strikes 
and all his customers stay at home and say he's only got about 18 months left on his lease at this point. He says, well, you know, my, my, the bargain's been frustrated. Well, why should, why should, the argument is, why should you ignore the fact that he's had this bonanza um, over the first part of the lease? Can a landlord not say, well, during the good times, instead of blowing all your money on a flash Harry car and a house in the south of France, you should have put, you should have put the money by because, you know, risk is part of business and um, an adverse risk has eventuated and you should have put the money by to, to guard against that adverse risk. Um, whereas if you, if you focus only on the bit of the term that's left, then he gets to, you know, the, 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 the landlord can't make that, that argument. That was, that was what I was, what I was thinking on my walk, whether it's right or not, I don't know. Cause I, I didn't have anyone to try the argument out on. It was just all going around in my head. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe some of our viewers can comment on it and um, they, they, they can let you know what they think about it. Um, in, in the meantime, um, a, another question has raised a slightly different issue that will arise if anyone's going to run a frustration case, which is um, how do parties in practice go about proving frustration? Um, I mean, if we're dealing in particular with the, the sort of case that's often described as frustration of purpose, um, what sort of evidence um, is required to prove what the original party's purposes were? Um, in the recent Brexit case, um, the, the judge uh, applying a, a, an earlier dictum in the Court of Appeal um, said that um, the, the parties have to provide evidence of um, their knowledge, expectations, assumptions, and contemplations when entering into the contract. Now, how on earth are we going to go about doing that? I, I mean, I, I, my own view of, of the, the test of the sea angel test that was applied in the Brexit, I mean, you have to put a cold towel around your head just looking at it, let alone applying it. Um, and what, what that test doesn't explain um, is, you know, how can you ascribe to parties um, their expectations, assumptions, contemplations and calculations, or A, what, do all that, what does all that mean anyway, but on a mutually and objective basis, um, how can you assess that um, mutually and objectively if you start delving into material outside the four corners of the contract? Uh, my view is that's extremely problematic. Um, I personally was very much attracted by the arguments in the Brexit case that the court should confine itself to considering the same type of material that would be admissible in um, construing contracts or implying terms. In other words, what, what is the admissible factual matrix? I mean, obviously that submission didn't find favour in that case. Um, and the reality was that what one had there was a vast amount of evidence as to the party's subjective intentions about lease negotiations that had taken place several years earlier, um, only to conclude at the end of it that each side was basically fighting its own commercial corner in, and there was no common purpose. But that's, in my view, that this type of um, the width of the potential admissible material um, has well and truly sort of thrown open the floodgates um, uh, in this area. And I, I think that's problematic, particularly for successors, but also for litigants more generally, because you know, in a sense, the doctrine has left the door ajar, hasn't it, slightly. And you may say there's a, there's a sort of bolt the other side of the door, when you can't blame litigants for wanting to press at the door and to see how far they can go. But I think the reality is they're going to spend a huge amount of money um, in complicated and uncertain litigation, probably to not have a successful outcome. So um, looking at it pragmatically, I don't think this the width of the material that is admissible um, is um, a, a positive thing at all. And I suppose even if we put to one side the problem we've already discussed about successors, um, you, if you've got a contract that was entered into by a large company, who's going to give the evidence about their expectations and their assumptions, et cetera, at the time that they entered into the contract? Uh, is the board of directors going to give that evidence? The agents who are negotiating the contract, the lawyers, heaven forbid, um, who, who's, who's actually going to be called to give that evidence? It, it's very difficult to know how 
um, that that would pan out in the, the sort of cases that, that we um, envisage might arise. Um, now, moving on in the, the questions, because there's quite a lot to, to get through here. Um, a, a number of you, um, presumably having latched on to um, the essential tenor of Anthony's talk, that it's going to be very difficult to argue frustration um, and looking at the effect of um, the, the pandemic and, and, and lockdowns and such like, um, have asked some questions about what, what alternatives um, that there might be for tenants um, who um, are faced with claims for arrears of rent during periods when they were forced to close their premises. Um, th th there are a few questions about the recent FCA insurance case um, and um, how, if at all, tenants might be able to rely on standard rent cessor clauses that we've got out there. Um, Francis, I think you, you've had some experience of looking at how insurance policies um, obtained by landlords might help or perhaps might not help in this situation. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you mentioned traditional rent cessor clauses, um, and unfortunately, they're not going to help very much in this scenario because, of course, the trigger in those is normally physical damage to property um, and COVID isn't going to cause physical damage to a property. I think um, what's got tenants a bit more, I was going to say excited, but I'm not sure anyone's that excited by anything at the moment, but moderately excited um, is the recent judgment in the FCA test case on business interruption insurance. Um, so earlier in the summer, they brought a case on behalf of policyholders looking at, um, importantly, non-damage extensions to policies. Um, and the wordings that they were focusing on related to notifiable diseases within a certain radius of the property, um, and also restrictions um, or even prohibitions on access to premises during the lockdown. Um, and it's, I mean, it's an 160 page judgment looking at very detailed policy wordings of, I think, over eight insurers. Um, but I think it's fair to say that in general, um, the court came down on the side of the policyholders and said that in general, these wordings would um, be triggered by COVID, um, which is obviously in a fairly bleak landscape for tenants, um, at least something to, to kind of pin some hope to. Um, of course, the parties or several parties have been given permission to appeal um, to the Supreme Court. Um, time will tell whether an appeal takes place, but you could assume that it probably um, most likely will happen. Um, but I think in the meantime, tenants are making protective claims because obviously there are time limits for making notifications on those. I think for this audience in particular of people interested in the property world, it's important to note that it wasn't a case um, focusing on sort of landlord tenant issues. Um, and I think there are some further problems to grapple with in terms of interaction of the policies with lease terms and how that works. Um, but I think certainly a kind of in light of the, the kind of difficulties and expense of perhaps pursuing a frustration claim, it's, it's a more practical option for tenants lucky enough to have taken out these business extension um, covers. Um, I think trying, trying to link back vaguely to um, frustration, which we're obviously meant to be talking about, um, there's obviously interesting points to raise in relation to insurance and foreseeability, because um, obviously with frustration, you, you're looking at a supervening event that the parties wouldn't have anticipated at the time they entered into a contract. Um, and perhaps having an insurance policy which covers notifiable diseases may not be helpful in that context. Um, on the other hand, it's a business interruption policy which perhaps sits in parallel to the lease rather than being woven into the fabric of the lease in the way that a traditional rent cessor provision would be there you know, formally allocating risk between landlord and tenant in the case of damage to property. So I'm not sure it has quite that impact on kind of ousting frustration for people who have business interruption insurance policies, um, but certainly a kind of interesting angle to think about. How, can I ask how wide, widespread, I mean, maybe you, you, you can't answer this, but I've got no sense of how common it is for businesses to take out business interruption insurance. I think, I mean, we've got, we've got several clients and, and the clients who are particularly interested are those in the kind of um, 
leisure sector, the hospitality sector and so on. Um, but as ever with insurance policies, I think both personally and professionally, I'm always banging my head against desks, um, thinking that actually you don't ever come across a policy which quite ever covers what you want it to. Um, but I think, I think there is some genuine optimism, at least until the appeal is heard, if there is one, um, from certain tenants, because there aren't many lifelines out there for them at the moment. And whilst there are moratoriums and so on, deferring rent payments, um, when the music stops on that, they need a way of paying rent, um, and because those bills will still be there at the end of the day. We were discussing this the other day, and um, as, you, as you know, uh, the All England Tennis Club has business interruption insurance because that was what enabled them to refund me the cost of my men's singles finals tickets for this year, which <laughs> unfortunately was, uh, was called off. So my once in a lifetime chance to see Nadal and Djokovic, presumably, um, play each other was, uh, but, they, but they had business interruption insurance, so I got my money back. But I don't, I don't know how, how, wide, how widespread it is, but um, well, as, as you say, it's... Extensions to policies, so um, not everyone will have these relevant extensions. Um, but, you know, it seems to be fairly widespread. Well, um, aside from the insurance position, um, we, we've got a question here that, that throws up an argument that um, I, I've heard bandied around from time to time over the last six months um, about whether or not there's any basis for a tenant to rely on an implied term in the lease that the rent shouldn't be payable while the premises can't be used. Um, does anyone think that an implied term of that sort might have legs? Well, I'm getting silence. Um, I mean, like, I think that. I think the difficulty with that is, if, you know, applying conventional the conventional principles on Im implication of terms, sort of the, the M and S um, case. You know, you've got it's a pretty high hurdle, and it's got to be essentially necessary for business efficacy, or otherwise goes without saying. Those sort that sort of a standard, and the difficulty with sort of saying, well, I shouldn't have to pay any rent during COVID, is that it shifts the blame entirely. Um, basically, from tenant to landlord, or that's what the argument is attempting to do. Um, and um, that type of uh, risk shifting is very unlikely to be justified. What, what the tenant really wants is, in a sense, a sort of um, a carve up or what, what, what the sensible thing is to do that the risk should in some sense be shared between landlord and tenant because if one looks at the, um, the, the, you've got the sort of code of practice, um, that talks about the landlord and the tenant and effectively being kind of economic collaborators rather than economic opponents. Um, and um, if you view it in that way, then the loss should be shared. It's not just a question of shifting it um, to the other side. The, that, again, then, then the question is, well, can you imply a duty of good faith? <laughs> and the problem with that, you know, so in other words, that the party should essentially be required to, to undertake the sort of exercise envisaged by the code of practice. But um, the English law has sort of generally held itself against um, the implication of good faith duties, and they may become more common, commonly encountered, but at the moment, I, I rarely see a lease with a good faith clause in it. I think, I think, I think there are two points. I agree with everything um, Camilla's just said. I think, I think there are two points. That firstly, you know, why, why, would a, why would a landlord agree this? I mean, if you're, if you're you're applying a term on the basis that essentially the parties would suppress the officious bystander with a testy O, of course, which still in substance remains the, the, the test, even post MS, as far as I understand it anyway. But um, why, why, would a, why would a landlord agree to, to a concession? And, and the second point is well, there are all sorts of possible rent concessions. You know, there could be a rent suspension, a rent reduction. Um, a deferral of payment, a instalment arrangement. Um, you, to imply a term, you have to be able to formulate the implied term pretty precisely as well. You have to know not just that the parties might have agreed some sort of implied term that gave some measure of relief in the circumstances, but precisely what what form that relief would take. Mm. And an argument for an implied term, had it not already broken down at the earlier stage, which is why would a landlord agree anyway? Um, would would break down at that 
second stage as well, it seems to me. Um, I think that's right, Anthony. And the enormous amount of negotiation and debate that's going into what's, what are kind of now called COVID clauses in, in new leases just backs that up. All of the points that people debate about, you know, what will be the triggers for these clauses? Will it be another, um, you know, lockdown based on COVID? Is it a mutation? Is it every pandemic forevermore? And then the debate about whether you're going to share rent 50-50 or whether you're just going to pay service charge or wait it all together. Um, not least how the hell you, you know, you get out of it at the end of the day and wind it down to the normal rent payment mechanism. So um, I think that only backs up the kind of detail that sits behind the thinking on carving things up like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and what about um, arguments that involve a, a cross claim by the tenant against the landlord trying to pin responsibility um, for the inability to use the premises on the landlord, derogation from grant covenant for quiet enjoyment, that sort of thing. I mean, that, that's also an argument that, that, is, that I've heard doing the rounds. Um, I mean, I think that there might be some scope for that in some circumstances, but it's probably going to be quite rare. I mean, take the case of um, a shopping centre, for example. Um, one might imagine that a tenant might be unhappy with the way that a landlord has managed the common parts. Maybe it feels that its footfall or to its door has been restricted by social measure, social distancing measures implemented by the landlord. Uh, in that sort of a case, one might imagine potentially the makings of some sort of argument that the landlord has in its management of the centre derogated from grant. Um, but I, I think, in, in, conversely, the landlord has an obligation to manage the centre, you know, effectively and, and probably no doubt in, in compliance with health and safety legislation. So if, in a sense, the landlord's done no more than one would expect a competent landlord to have done, it's going to be very difficult to sustain a claim. But there may be cases where um, the landlord's gone a bit too far in terms of, of, of that. Um, in, in your sort of bog standard case, I don't, you know, it's very, it won't be possible to say that the landlord has done anything wrong or failed to do anything um, because it, it's not the landlord's fault that there's a pandemic or um, that the um, retail or hospitality sectors had to close down that, that's not something that can be um, laid at the landlord's door in most cases. Um, ju just as you were mentioning um, shopping centres Camilla, Philip Myers of, of Greece um, commented that um, the argument could um, work in a shopping centre situation where a landlord's covenanted to ensure that the centre is maintained as a high class shopping centre or a similar sort of landlord's covenant. Um, so th there could well be avenues there. Um, and uh, when we were, were discussing some of this earlier in the week, um, Anthony um, mentioned to me um, a, a case that was decided some time ago um, where the, the Crown was the landlord um, and the demise premises were requisitioned under a government order. Um, and the, the rather ingenious argument was run that because it was effectively the landlord who had prevented the tenant from occupying by um, virtue of making that um, requisitioning order, um, no rent should be due for that reason. But that, that um, argument was rejected in that case. Um, effectively, it was said the Crown was acting for the public benefit in making the um, regulations which led to the closure, um, rather than acting wearing its hat as landlord. Um, but, but there may, I suppose, be some scope, um, albeit limited, for um, this sort of cross-claim. Um, now, another um, angle which we, we might look at, um, which comes out of a question that came in um, a little earlier, um, looks not, not to um, claims under current leases, but at looking ahead at, at negotiating new leases. And Francis, I think you, you mentioned earlier um, that the so-called COVID clause. Mm. Uh, do, do, do you think that, that that might start to become commonplace? I think it's early days, isn't it, to know whether it's going to become market standard. Um, <clears throat> It's certainly something that, particularly in a retail context, is being talked about a lot. 
um, and a lot of the big retail chains are pursuing quite aggressively. Um, and they're in a good place to negotiate because there's obviously a lot of empty retail space at the moment and their demands are listened to. Um, to be honest, I've, I've heard more people talking about it and debating and hammering out the terms than I've seen final done and dusted COVID clauses. Um, there seems to be a, a bit of a common theme as to the ones I've seen and they're generally landlords who are just about to sell properties or shopping centres who won't have to deal with the fallout of actually managing the terms going into the future. But I think um, absolutely in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of market where landlords and tenants are trying to do something more bespoke that suits them rather than, you know, frustration, for example, would be such a blunt instrument and just bring everything to a close. What, what tenants want, don't want really is to lose all of their shops forevermore. They want a rent holiday, they want terms which work for them now. Um, landlords obviously aren't, aren't quite so keen, but I think in this market, there, there is a lot of negotiation and interest in, in COVID clauses. And what, what about um, turnover rents? Do, 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 do we think that they're um, going to um, be um, more um, common in, in leases to be negotiated? Yeah, I think um, certainly institutional landlords historically, obviously they like their fixed upwards only market rent um, and have been quite snippy about turnover rents. But you do sense a genuine seriousness about engaging on them now. Um, again, it's what, it's what tenants want on the new Lick CDA, 400 stores um, went on to a turnover rent basis. Um, and there seems to be a real drive within the market to look at a kind of standardised approach to turnover rents and to actually grapple with all the problems. People have spoken for a long time about how it doesn't work with internet shopping and how you, you know, attribute sales to stores and so on. Um, but I think now there is a genuine appetite um, to look at how this could work. Um, and it's a different relationship. It's a kind of investor relationship, a landlord as a shareholder in a, in a tenant's success, really. Um, but my view is, is they're definitely on the up. Um, and, and again, I suppose another angle on that is, um, do, do we think that um, renewals of existing leases under the 1954 Act might see um, arguments for this type of um, COVID-related clause and turnover rent introduced? I mean, I, I mean I've had done 54 at work in, during this pandemic and my experience is that tenants, particularly in the retail sector, are pushing ag aggressively um, for COVID clauses and in some circumstances extremely broad COVID clauses. I mean, they're sort of um, large retailers who probably have a, a, a bit of clout behind them um, and who landlords want to kind of keep on board. Um, you know, in terms of actually, you know, um, do, will these arguments come good on a renewal? I'd sort of, that's far more questionable, really, because I think um, OME is a you know, considerable hurdle um, to anyone trying to introduce COVID clauses where they don't currently exist, which, which they won't. Um, but I mean, you know, over time, if if the, if they do become more common in the market, then you can see the makings of sort of arguments further down the line that COVID clauses, you know, have become commonplace and should be included to, to properly modernise your lease. But at the moment, I think it's problematic. And, and of course, the converse point is that if you get your COVID clause, you're going to have to pay for it through the rental. And that could be quite a significant hike in the rent. So maybe retail tenants might be better off looking to get their own insurance than basically paying for landlord's insurance through through their rent. Um, so yes, definitely a live issue that's cropping up in renewals in, in my experience. Then I think we've just got time for, for one more question before we have to end. Um, one of you mentioned earlier the um, code of practice that um, the, um, the, 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 the government published some months ago the, called the Code of Practice for Commercial Property Relationships during the pandemic. Um, and that code sets out conduct which is considered to be desirable from parties to agreements relating to commercial property, but it doesn't, of course, have the force of law. Um, what, what incentive is there for a commercial landlord or a tenant, for that matter, to adhere to it? Um, and it, it can't in itself 
um, seems to me, provide a defense to a claim for arrears um, under a lease. Um, so um, how in practice is it going to um, regulate the landlord-tenant relationship um, and assist tenants who are in difficulty? I'm getting silence on that. I, I, <laughs> take it that that, that question <laughs> possibly, possibly just sort of in a sense it's a re reflection of good market practice it's sort of driven by market practice rather than driving market practice and actually peer pressure might be you know um wanting to be seen to be doing the right thing but i think the reality is that the part, part landlords and tenants are going to look after their own commercial interests at the end of the day um and but maybe the answer is that a collaborative approach is the better commercial approach for both parties and that this is just a sort of a helpful way um, of, of guiding parties in the right direction, right? Sort of, um, sort of carrot rather than stick. I, th I think that's right. And when you look at the kind of March and June quarter, I think perhaps there was more collaboration at that stage than there is now when there seems to be a bit of a never ending scenario. Certainly, from the perspective of, of, um, of landlord clients who we talk to, they query what's in it for them. They can only come out of this with a deal where they get less rent than they're entitled to. And of course there are costs associated with the process, but in a, in a world in which there are so many other moratoriums and things going on, um, it's another kind of string to their bow. It's something to consider when, when actually there's not a lot else um, they can do. And the code of practice might have a costs, costs consequences. Um, you know, you might, you know, the court might be interested, obviously costs are always discretionary. If you could sort of waltz in and say, well, the parties refused, you know, the other side refused to um, even engage with the code of practice, then, then, you know, similarly to refusing to go to mediation, it might have the same sort of, um, could potentially sound in adverse cost consequences. Right, well, I've been told I have to have a strict eye on the time, and I think we, we've now reached the end of our allotted time. Um, apologies to those whose questions we haven't been able to cover. Um, may I thank um, once again Anthony Tanny for his excellent lecture, um, and also um, my fellow panellists for their discussion this evening. Um, I should also express a vote of thanks to the Blundell Committee, chaired by Janet Bignall, um, and to Quadrilect, who've helped to organise this event um, online this year. Um, and finally, thank you all for joining us. Next year, we hope that the Blundell Lectures will resume their traditional in-person format, um, and I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible then. Good evening. <laughs>